director, actor Tyler Perry. Okay, how unbelievable is this? How unbelievable is this? I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you really quickly, I was, um, this is surreal to me. I remember being about five or six years old and imagining that I had wings on my back. And I would wear my um, coat in the summertime because I didn't want people to know about my imaginary wings. I had a very active imagination. I could always have a vision. I, I thank God for that. My imagination is what carried me through. When I was about nine or ten, I imagined being able to own my own business and being an entrepreneur, yeah. which, was, which was pretty difficult to do where I was where I was growing up, and you know, you, I had no role models around to show me that that could happen. But I still had my imagination. When I was about uh, 18, 19 years old, I wrote my first movie, and I imagined being able to uh, inspire and encourage and make people laugh all around the world. That was a difficult dream, but I was able to imagine that. When I turned about 30, I imagined, op imagined opening this place. And, uh, but in everything that I've imagined, I never thought. There would be a day when the presidential motorcade would come through Southwest. Giving all of these little boys and little girls a glimpse of what destiny looks like. Yes, yes. The very fact that the president is here should speak to the possibility of all of us taking the limits off of our own imagination. Right. It should speak to the possibilities of all of us being better, a better you, a better me. It should speak to the possibilities of a better today and a better tomorrow. And in that better tomorrow, it speaks to the possibility of four more years. And all that I imagined, I never imagined I would be able to say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Somebody upon whose shoulders I stand. Uh, the great Congressman John Lewis is in the house. Other outstanding members of the congressional de delegation here in Georgia. Sanford Bishop. David Scott. Hank Johnson. Somebody who, I, I, I was just reminiscing, when I first started to run for office, a lot of people weren't sure whether a guy named Barack Obama <laughs> could win. And so we went down to uh, to the Sel Selma commemoration, yeah. Emmett Pettus Bridge. And we're in church, and a lot of folks at that point are still wondering you know, whether this is a good idea that this young guy is running for president. And uh, this man gets up on stage and he explains how uh, people call him a little crazy. But there is good crazy and there's bad crazy. 
he tells me now that he came up with the idea when his doctor explained to him there was good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. <laughs> <laughs> but he decided that uh, supporting Barack Obama was a good kind of crazy, he said. Uh, we have been dear friends ever since. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Joseph Lowry. <laughs> And finally, let me, uh, let me just say about something about the man who introduced us, um, mm -hmm. Tyler Perry, mm -hmm. uh, hosting us all at uh, his incredible facility. Uh, you know, he and I were talking, and there's something about America where somebody from my background, can do what I'm doing, and somebody from Tyler's background can do what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and and as, as, as tough as things get sometimes, and as, as frustrated, cynical people can get about politics, uh, when you look at a Tyler Perry and all that he's achieved, and the humility and graciousness with which he's achieved it, uh, you can't help but be proud of him and to be proud of our country. So give it up for Mr. Tyler Perry. Now, uh, I'm here today not only because I need your help, I'm here because the country needs your help. There, 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 there was a lot of reasons why so many of you decided to get involved and then just work your hearts out in the campaign in 2008. It was not because you thought it would be easy. Uh, the odds of me becoming president were long. You didn't need a poll to know it was going to be tough. You didn't join the campaign because of me. You joined it because of your commitment to each other and the vision that we share about America. It wasn't a vision where just a few people do well, and everybody else is on their own, and the most powerful are able to make their own rules. It wasn't a cramped vision or a selfish vision of America. It wasn't a, a limited vision about our future. It was a vision of America where everybody who works hard has a chance to get ahead. Not just those who are born into it, but a Tyler Perry, or a Barack Obama, or a child in Georgia, or a child in a barrio in Texas, or a poor child in some rural community in the Midwest. It didn't matter. They would have a chance if they were willing to work hard. That's the vision we share. That's the change we believed in. We knew it wouldn't come easy, we knew, knew it wouldn't come quickly, but we believed. And in just three years, because of what you did in 2008, we've begun to see what change looks like. Yes. 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 Change is the first bill I signed into law, a law that says women deserve an equal day's pay for an equal day's work. <laughs> Because I don't want my daughters treated any differently than your sons. I want them to have the same opportunities. That's what change is. Change is the decision we made to rescue the American auto industry. At a time when it was on the verge of collapse and some folks were saying let Detroit go bankrupt, we had one million jobs on the line and I wasn't going to let them go. Today, GM is back on top, the number one automaker in the world. Yeah. Just reported the highest profits in 100 year history. With more than 200,000 new jobs added, the U.S. auto industry is back. That's what change is. That's what you did. Change is the decision we made to, to stop waiting for Congress to do something about energy. We've, had, we've been listening to politicians for three decades, four decades, saying they were going to do Something about energy, we went ahead and did it. Raised fuel efficiency standards on cars. By the next decade, we'll be driving American-made cars getting 55 miles a gallon. That'll save the average family $8,000 at the pump. That's what change is. And it happened because of you. 
Change, cha change is us deciding, you know what, why, why are we giving $60 billion to the banks to manage the student loan program? Let's give it directly to the students. So that millions of poor young people are either getting higher Pell Grants or are finally eligible. Being able to invest in things like early education and community colleges and HBCUs. Change is attacking the cycle of poverty. Not by just pouring money into a broken system, but by building on what works. Promised neighborhoods. The idea of pulling all our resources together to make sure that everybody has a chance Rebuilding our public services, public housing, making sure that our education system is working, yeah. making sure that we've got partnerships with local leaders like Kasim Reed, yeah. all across the country, rebuilding cities, one block, one neighborhood at a time. That's what change is. Change is, yes, health care reform. Yeah. You want to call it Obamacare, that's okay, because I do care. That is why we passed it. Because I care about folks who were going bankrupt because they were getting sick. Thank you. And I care about children who have pre-existing conditions and their families couldn't get them any kind of insurance. Thank you. Thank you. So now we've got reforms that will ensure that in this great country of ours, you won't have to mortgage your house just because you get sick. Right, right now, 2.5 million young people already have health insurance who didn't have it before because of this law. It let them stay on their parents' policies. Insurance companies can't just deny you coverage or drop your coverage at a time when you need it most. Seniors are seeing more help when it comes to their prescription drugs and preventive care. Yeah. That's what change is. Yeah. Change is the fact that for the first time in history, you don't have to hide who you love in order to serve the country you love. Yeah. We ended Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Thank you. Change is keeping the promise I made in 2008 for the first time in nine years. There are no Americans fighting in Iraq. Yeah. We decided to refocus on the folks who actually attacked us on 9-11 and thanks to the brave men and Women in uniform, Al-Qaeda is weaker than it has ever been, and Osama bin Laden is not walking this face, the face of this earth. None of this has been easy. And we still have a lot of work to do, because there are a lot of folks who are still hurting out there. A lot of folks still pounding the pavement looking for work. A lot of people whose homes values have dropped. A lot of people who are still struggling to make the rent. There's still too many families you know, who can barely pay their bills. Too many young people still living in poverty. Wow. You know, I, I was reading a statistic the other day. Fewer than half of African Americans believe we'll reach the dream Dr. King left for us. Wow. So we've still got so much work to do. Yes. And I know when we look at what is, it can be heartbreaking and frustrating. But I ran for president, and you joined this cause, because we don't settle just for what is, we, we strive for what might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We want to help more Americans reach that dream. Yes. I ran for president to give every child a chance. Whether he's born in Atlanta or comes from a rural town in the Delta, I ran for president not just to get us back to where we were, but to take us forward to where we need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm telling you, Atlanta, we are going to get there. Yeah. Step by step, we are going to get there. Already over the past two years, our businesses have added almost four million new jobs. Yeah. Manufacturers are creating jobs for the first time since the 1990s. The recovery is accelerating. Our economy is getting stronger. We're moving on the right track. What we can't do is go back to the same policies that got us into this mess in the first place. Of course, that's exactly what the other folks want to do. The 
folks who are running for president. <laughs> No secret about it. They want to roll back the laws that we put in place so that now Wall Street can play by its own rules again. They want to go back to the day when insurance companies could deny you coverage or jack up your premiums anytime they wanted without reason. They want to spend trillions more on tax breaks for the very wealthiest of individuals. Even if it means adding to the deficit, even if it means gutting things like education or our investment in clean energy or making sure Medicare is stable. Their philosophy is simple. Everybody's just left to fend for themselves. If those in power could make their own rules, then somehow it's all going to trickle down to you. Yeah. And they're wrong. They're wrong. They were wrong when they tried it. And they're wrong now. In the United States of America, we are always greater together than we are on our own. We're always better off when we keep that basic American promise. That if you work hard, you can do well enough to raise a family and own a home and send your kids to college and put a little away for retirement. And that's the choice in this election. We've, we've got different visions being presented. This is not just another political debate. This is the defining issue of our time. What are we going to do to make sure that middle class families are secure and that we continue to build ladders for people who are trying to get into the middle class? We don't need, we don't need, a, we don't need an economy that's built on outsourcing and bad debt and phony financial profits. We need an economy that's built to last. An economy that's built on American manufacturing. American energy and giving skills to American workers and holding up those values that we cherish hard work fair play shared responsibility you know when, when we think about the next generation of manufacturing I don't want to take it root in Asia I want to take it root in Atlanta I don't want this nation just to be known for buying and consuming things from other countries. I want to build and sell to other countries products made in the United States of America. I want to stop rewarding businesses that are shipping jobs overseas. I want to reward companies like this one that are creating jobs right here in the United States of America. I want to make sure that our schools are the envy of the world. And that means investing in the men and women who stand in front of the classroom. You know, a, a, a good teacher increases the income of a classroom by over $2,500. A great teacher can help a child move beyond their immediate circumstances, reach out for their dreams. I don't want Washington to defend the status quo, but I don't want them to be just bashing teachers. I want to give schools the resources they need to keep good teachers on the job and reward the best teachers and grant schools flexibility to teach with creativity and passion. Stop teaching to the test. Replace teachers that aren't helping kids learn. I want us to, to, to create in this country the kind of passion and reverence for education. It's not just, by the way, a job of government, but it's a job of each of us as parents, as community leaders. Right. And when kids do graduate, I want them to be able to afford to go to college. Right. We've got more tuition debt than credit card debt today. Yeah. And by the way, right now, interest rates are scheduled to go up on student loans in July if Congress does not act, so you guys need to get on Congress about that. And I've said to colleges and universities, you've got to stop tuition from just going up and up and up and up. Yeah. Higher education cannot be a luxury, it is an economic imperative yeah. that every family should be able to afford. Yeah. I want an economy that's supporting the scientists and researchers that'll make sure we discover the next breakthrough in biotechnology yeah. and clean energy. Yes. You know, we have subsidized oil companies for a hundred years. Give them $4 billion worth of tax breaks when they are making near record profits. Get rid of them. It is time 
to stop giving tax giveaways to an industry that's never been more profitable and start investing in clean energy that can create jobs here in the United States and solar power and wind power and biofuels. We need to give our businesses the best infrastructure in the world. Newer roads and airports and faster railroads and internet access. You take half the money that we've been spending on the wars in, in Iraq as we phase down the war in Afghanistan. Let's pay down, half, use half of it to pay down our debt. Let's use the other half to do some nation building here at home. Let's put people to work rebuilding schools, rebuilding our bridges, rebuilding our ports. And to pay for this, we've got to have a tax system that is fair. I was with Warren Buffett a couple days ago. He says, uh, thanks for naming a rule after me. <laughs> we, it's a very simple principle, the Buffett rule. It says, if you make more than a million dollars a year, you should not pay a lower tax rate than your secretary. <laughs> We've said if you make less than $250,000 a year, which is 98% of Americans, your taxes shouldn't go up. But folks like me, we can afford to do a little more. Tyler can afford to do a little more, Tyler. He knows he can. Yeah, well, when we say that, is it this, this is not class warfare. This is not envy. Right, right. No. Fair. This, this, this is just basic math. Because if, if Tyler or I or others get tax breaks we don't need, weren't asking for, that the country can't afford, That's right. then one of two things are going to happen. Either the deficit goes up, all these other folks, they say they want to do something about the deficit, every single one of their plans actually increases the deficit. Or, alternatively, they got to make up for it by taking it away from somebody who really needs it. The student who suddenly sees their interest on their loans going up. The senior who suddenly has to pay more for Medicare. The veteran who's not getting help after having protected us. The family that's trying to get by. It's not right. It's not who we are. I hear a lot of politicians talk about values during election year. You know what? I'm happy to have a values debate. I debate about values. I think about the values my mother and my grandparents taught me. Hard work, that's a value. Looking out for one another, that's a value. I am my brother's keeper, I am my sister's keeper. That is a value. You know, each of us is only here because somebody, somewhere, was looking out for us. It started in the family, but it wasn't just the immediate family. There was somebody in church. There was somebody in the neighborhood. There was the coach of the Little League. There was somebody who made an investment in our country's future. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our story has never been about what we can do alone, it's what we do together. We don't right. win the race for new jobs and middle class security and new businesses with the same old you are on your own economics. I'm telling you, it does not work. It did not work in the decade before the Great Depression. It did not work in the decade before I took office. Yeah. Yeah. It won't work now. Yeah. This is about who we are as a country. The opportunities we've always, always passed on to future generations. I, when I think about Michelle and, 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 and me and where we come from, you know, I know y'all love Michelle. I remember too. Sometimes you know, we'll be in the White House, and, and you know, we, we think about my mother-in-law, who lives upstairs, and was was a secretary. You know, Michelle's dad uh, uh, had multiple sclerosis. 
and still went to work every day, blue collar job. My mom raising me a single mom. Hello. You know, I, I think about, you know, what they did for us um, and the sacrifices they made. Uh, and so then I think, well, the sacrifices that I have to make, given all the blessings that I've received, they can't just extend to Belia and Sasha. I've got to be thinking about somebody else's kids. That's right. That's right. I've got to be making sure that somebody else gets a student loan who's maybe a single mom going back to school, just like my mom was able to get a student loan to get an education. I'm thinking, you know, we've got to make sure that uh, you know, jobs are out there for folks who are willing to work and overcoming barriers. And, and I'm willing to make some sacrifices for that. And that makes my life better. Right? Right? Yeah. And, and most of you understand that. You, you understand if you invest in a teacher and then she teaches somebody who's the next Steve Jobs or invents some cure for a major disease, that makes us all better. Yeah. We invest in internet services for rural Georgians. There's a little store out there that suddenly business starts booming because they now have a worldwide market through the internet. And that creates economic opportunity for everybody. That idea is not a democratic idea, it is not a republican idea. That is an American idea. Abraham Lincoln understood it. The first Republican president during a war invested in the Transcontinental Railroad, National Academy of Sciences, land grant colleges. You know, Dwight Eisenhower, Republican, built interstate highway system. Teddy Roosevelt, Republican called for a progressive income tax. This is not just a democratic idea. This is an American idea that we invest in our future and that we are stronger together than we are on our own. And you know, sometimes that spirit may seem uh, to have vanished in Washington. Sometimes it, it may seem like our politics is just a bad reality show. <laughs> People arguing and fussing. All of these other men. Trying to <laughs> score points. That's right. But you know, out in the country, when I go to town halls, when I go to VFW Hall, you know, that spirit is still there. People still understand, you know, this country that gave us so much, uh, we want to pass that on to the next generation. They understand that it's not just about us, it's about what we can do for each other. It's not just about the next election, it's about the next generation. You talk to our men and women in uniform, they understand it. You talk to folks in, in our places of worship, they recognize it. And all of you recognize it. And that's what we tapped into in 2008. That spirit. That spirit. So, so let me just say this. You know, uh, I'm a little grayer now. We call that salt in the south. I'm a little, got some bumps and bruises. Mm -hmm. I, I know, I know, I know that uh, over the last three years there have been times where we've suffered setbacks. Change hasn't come as fast as we would have liked. And, you know, people still got the old hope poster. It's, it's like fading a little bit. <laughs> And I know that, that there are times where you might start feeling cynical about what's possible. No. 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 But I just want to remind you, 
when I said back in 2009, I said change is hard. I, I, I said this may not happen in one year, it may not happen in one term, it may not happen with one president. But if, if we stick with it, if we're determined, if we understand the rightness of our cause, if, if we continue to think not in terms of just what's good for me, but what's good for us, we'll get there. And I also told you, I told you I, I'm not a perfect man and, and I won't be a perfect president, but I said I'd always tell you what I thought, I would always tell you where I stood, and I would wake up every single day thinking about you and working as hard as I know how to make your lives a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. And I have kept that promise. I have kept that promise these last three years. And so, and so, if you're willing to get back to organize, if you're willing to get on the phone and email and tweet and knock on doors and do what needs to be done. If you feel the same passion and same energy and same determination as I do, and I feel it more now than I have ever felt it in my life, then I promise you, we will finish what we started. 2008 was the beginning. We're still on that journey. We've got five more years of work. Force. I promise you change will come. The change you believe in will come. And we will remind the world once again just why it is the United States of America is the greatest country ever. God bless the United States of America.